Hi, guys. Are you there? We're yeah. here. Can you see us? Yes, I see you and I hear you. Sorry. Okay. Something weird happened on my end. Um, so I had to restart things. Oh, there's all kinds of people wanting to get in. Admit. Admit. Hey, Carol. Hey. Did you try that ball? No, I, I need to get the pump. Oh, okay. Yeah. It doesn't quite work so well deflated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> as long as it doesn't deflate when you're on it, that's when you're in trouble. When? If you're on it and it deflates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I asked everybody to try to log in early, and then I've had all kinds of trouble on my end. I had to reboot my Zoom meeting. But I think we're a forgiving crowd. Okay. You're a forgiving crowd. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. I, have I admitted everybody? There's Susan. Okay. This is the romper room section. I see Sarah. I see Carol. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, we're not recording yet, are we? Well, we're always recording, but um, I will be deleting, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and at his mercy in terms you, of what he deletes. Yeah, anything he's terrible. You can keep that joke, though. You should splice that joke in, actually. If <laughs> sure. It was actually. One of my best jokes of the day. Okay. Well, <laughs> you, you can only go uphill from here. No. All right. Let me make sure I've got everybody in. Sarah, are you still pregnant? Oh, yes, very much so. We're, our camera's off right now because we're stuffing our faces with pizza and we didn't want to subject you all to that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm eating a hot pie. It's glorious. That's that's fine. That's fine. Um, so let's see. I think I've got everybody in who's asked to be in. Let me see here. Sorry about that. Missing Mary Ann. Yeah. I'm wondering where she is. Carol's here. The Medinas are here. Jim Olson is here. Come on. Track pads. Billy's here. So Billy, how's the weather in India? It's getting uh, better for the better? past two days. Yeah, much better. Cooler? Cooler and dampy weather, so yeah. But no rains, yeah. No rain. Yes, that's a good thing. It's gotten very, very balmy here in western Massachusetts. Wow, we got under the seventies today, which is warm for us in the middle of October. Mm -hmm. Very nice. <laughs> very nice, huh? You'll take it. Yeah, I'll we went it. down into the seventies today. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Now, Dave. Sorry, I just have to, you. every once in a while, I just need to. You want to find out, Dave, you know, how spiritual your cat is. Uh, uh, he, she's he's washing his own feet. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a servant. <laughs> Serving himself, which is what he does best. <laughs> Before we start, I wanted to tell everybody my sister's um, COVID test came back negative, so thank you for praying. Oh, good. That's yeah, good. that was that was a relief. Am I remembering right? She works in a nursing home or in? No, she's a vet. She's a vet. an oh, that's right. vet or something. I don't know exactly, but she's some sort of specialist vet. Uh -huh. So she has vet nurses. I mean, they're they're people, vet but techs. no, they're not vet techs. That's different than a vet nurse. Whatever. But one of her nurses had COVID, so. Right. Oh, right. Yep. That's right. Somebody that she was working with. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Let's see. Well, we should get started. Well, I appreciate you all zooming in tonight. Um, I, I don't know if you remember Abija. I actually heard from her today. She hasn't, she's only come once or twice, um, but she now is working on Thursday evenings and is trying to see if she can join us in the future, but she won't be with us tonight. Um, so uh, let's, let's start with a word of prayer, and we're going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles handy, you'll want to look at that. Um, but let's start with prayer. Um, Lord, we just thank you for watching over us. Thank you that Lynn's sister is okay. Um, and uh, once again, we ask that you would use this time um, to stir up our thoughts, to enliven our hearts, to expand our understanding, and to continue to have a growing passion for your church, Lord. Um, we know that you're passionate about the church, um, and we want to better reflect the kind of church that you have, want us to be. So use our time together in your word and our discussion uh, to those ends. Amen. All right, let me pull up the PowerPoint. Comes. Yep. Okay, is everyone seeing the PowerPoint? Yep. Great. Great. I'm just going to change the view here so I can see all your beautiful faces at once. Um, so we're we're up to episode seven here, and we're just in chapter three. <laughs> typical typical Raker teaching here, um, and believe it or not, I'm going kind of fast. I'm, there's so much I'm skipping <laughs> because we're focusing on on the church, right? Um, so it, it's interesting. Chapter three has this one incident of um, Peter and John healing the lame man, right? And um, we know that there have been signs and wonders happening already. Back in Acts 2 and verse 43, um, the, the author of Acts, Luke, told us that um, many wonders and miracles were being perf uh, performed and taking place through the apostles, right? And people were feeling a sense of awe. Um, so as we move into chapter 3, um, we suddenly kind of zero in on one miracle, right? Um, he's just sort of said in passing that miracles are taking place and, and people are amazed and people are attracted to the community. But now he focuses in on this one. And so there's an interesting question here. Um, why? Why, why, did, why did Luke, why does Luke, who had already mentioned miracles, why does he give us detail on this one? What's unique uh, or what's precipitous? Um, about this miracle of healing the lame man. And I'll just put it, I'm curious as to if you have any thoughts about that. I, I think there are two reasons. Is it one of the first, it's not one of the first ones done in Christ's name, is it? Well, we're not really sure. I mean, in, in Acts 2.43, he just says miracles are taking place. We can only assume that they were invoking the name of Jesus, but yeah, we don't really know. But it, it is, that is something that we clearly see in how this uh, miracle works. Here comes Marianne. I think it's that the focus was on two of the main apostles, number one, and number two, it elicited a response from the temple leadership. Okay, all right, good. Um, Elicited a response from the temple leadership. Any other ideas? I, I believe there was more opposition from uh, the Jews. Right. And so, yes. Okay, good. So he, he, here's the thing. I, I think, um, oops, hold on. I think one reason is that it, this is sort of a model miracle. <laughs> it's a model signs and wonders. It's a model example of healing. Um, you know, as you guys have already mentioned, they, 
to do it in Jesus's name. Uh, just kind of the way they, they approach this guy. We'll reflect on that a little bit more. We're not going to take a lot of time on this tonight. Um, but it's, it's just a nice, clear example of doing healing ministry. Um, it, it, what I call kingdom evangelism, or it's sometimes been called power evangelism. Um, so we'll, we'll reflect on that just a little bit more. But I think that's one of the reasons that Luke focuses in on. It's just a nice, clear example of doing evangelism uh, in connection with uh, signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit. And then as you guys have been picking up, this is a miracle that touches off persecution, um, which begins with the temple officials. Um, you know, we're told in Acts 2 at the end of the chapter that um, people were, were feeling a sense of awe and they were having uh, favor with all the people, right? It said in 247. Not so much anymore. Now with this miracle, favor with all the people, um, uh, at least not all the people uh, begins to happen. Uh, Antonio, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, you know, uh, part of my interest is to to find the harmony between the New Testament and the Old Testament. Mm. So do you think that, that the emphasis on this miracle in Acts chapter 3 has to do with Isaiah 35 and 6? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely do. We're, we're, we're headed right there. Very okay. Good. okay. Very, yeah, very good. Very good. Yes, I, I, I think that's, you know, really significant. Not, not simply because it makes a connection, but the connection it is making with the Old Testament. Um, so let's, let's just consider for a moment uh, the healing of the lame man. And uh, somebody read verses 1 through 10 for us. Who can get it the quickest? I got it. Okay, thanks, Dave. I also have a dog barking, sorry. Um, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. The whole song starts running in my head right about now. Uh-huh, yes. <laughs> um, but what do I have, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. So how many of you know that, that song? We were singing it in the 70s. <laughs> Peter and yep. John went to pray. They saw a lame man on the way. Okay, enough of that. Um, so, is there something that's anything that strikes you about the way they perform this healing? You already, Sarah had already mentioned about uh, in Jesus' name. Anything else that strikes you just about the modus operandi? They were trying to get a read on him first. Look at us. Right. You well, wanted to get a real sense of, well, you know, what what exactly do you want? Are you a person of faith? Uh, you know, are, do you have the faith to be healed? Or uh, I don't, I don't, maybe I don't even fully understand what it is they're looking for, but it seems to me that's what they were. You're you're on the right track. Yeah, they they really engage this guy, right? They they look at him, they give him their attention, they ask for his attention upon them. Uh, they engage him in a very personal way. They touch him. They take hold of him. They help him to his feet. Um, again, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, you know, talking about this. That's not really our focus in this series. But I just, I just wanted to highlight that. It's, uh, 
because we see that in Jesus's ministry, his, his very uh, uh, connecting with people uh, in a very personal way. And, and Peter and John just, you know, follow Jesus's example uh, in that regard. So um, it's interesting that the crowd is pretty amazed, right? This guy jumps up, he's walking, he's leaping. Um, the, the crowd responds with wonder and amazement, it says in verse 10. Um, and so then how does Peter respond uh, to the crowd? And this actually, if you read on, let, let me just read this, verses 11 and 12 and 13. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. And he kind of goes on. And then uh, where is it down in? 16 he says on the basis of faith in his name it is the name of jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all so what is peter doing in his response to the crowd immediately engaging them with the scriptures mm -hmm. pointing to the authority by which it's happening Mm -hmm. and and uh, creating an opportunity to share Christ. Right. So but what's really striking is he, he immediately deflects attention away from himself, right? See, it's not about him. It's not about John. Um, it's about Jesus. You know, don't, don't look at us, Peter says. We, it's not our power. It's not our piety that has done this. It's Jesus. It's Jesus who has done this, right? Um, so Peter points to Jesus. And right here we encounter another good church principle. And it probably to all of you, this seems obvious. <laughs> and the church principle is this, that godly church leaders do not seek their own glory, but Christ's glory. Right? Obviously. But, you know, we need to say that because how often have we seen <laughs> church leaders who are really seeking their own glory? It's all about getting their name on a building or, or uh, you know, people giving them money or giving them cars or planes or whatever, you know, and it, it's about their ministry and it's not about Jesus. We shouldn't have to say this, but unfortunately we do. The godly church leaders don't seek their own glory, but Christ's. So, you know, when you're looking for a good godly leader, you want to look for somebody who's <laughs> humble and deflecting to, to Christ and not uh, not constantly pumping themselves up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's let's think about Peter's message. So he deflects the crowd from uh, uh, wondering about you know Peter and John's power, and he says, "No, this is all Jesus is doing," and he launches in uh, to a sermon, which we're not going to take the time to read here, but I hope you read in your own time. Um, and, you know, he connects with the Old Testament. He, he, he uh, connects with some prophecy. And it's, he's talking about Jesus. So, you know, if you had a chance, if, if this is an evangelistic message, you know, coming on the heels of this miracle. Um, he gives them a verbal proclamation uh, of the gospel. And, you know, as I say, this series, we're not, we're not kind of going through everything that Acts has to say. We're just looking for those church principles. So I'm not spending, I'm not going to spend time looking closely at his sermon. I didn't uh, at his sermon in, in Acts 2. Um, but I would encourage you to do so because they are, they're good models. We get a number of sermons throughout Acts, um, preaching throughout Acts, that are good models of how to preach, how to, how to share the gospel with people. Maybe not even necessarily in one setting, but um, hitting certain points. And so here's one, you know, out potential outline that I created uh, on Peter's second sermon recorded here in, in Acts. And you can look at that uh, in, in your own time. But here's what I want to get at for us tonight. What characterizes Peter's second sermon? And we noted this before with his first sermon. 
how can we how can we sum it up? What are the two main things that he messages he gets across uh, in this sermon? I'm testing your memory because we we touched on this with it in Acts two. Repentance. <laughs> yep, which we called what? If the gospel is what? Good news. Right. Then to get the good news, you also have to have what? Oh, right. Bad news. Bad news. <laughs> the bad news, right? Some bad so, news for you. So Peter gives them bad news as well as good news, right? And as I've, as I've said before, um, the whole gospel must be preached uh, as we're seeking to win people to Christ and disciple people in Christ. They need to understand the bad news as well as the good news. You cannot fully appreciate the good news if you don't grasp the bad news. And I'll make one other point here. Um, oh, no, I'm not going to make it here. <laughs> I'm going to make it later, actually. Um, I thought I had that here. I guess I don't. Okay. Um, so it, it, it's it's not enough. Actually, I will put this here. Um, it's not enough to just do good works or, or even display power. Um, people must be told the gospel. They have to be told that whole gospel of the bad news and the good news. Um, and there needs to be a verbal explanation of the gospel. In Romans 10, 14, Paul talks about how will they hear without a preacher. And he doesn't mean an ordained minister. He means any Christian telling somebody the gospel. So it's not that Peter and John heal this guy and say, isn't that great? And they walk away. Um, they connect this uh, act of, of mercy, of compassion, of power with a verbal proclamation of the gospel. So there's this importance of that verbal explanation. Um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I, I don't really, you know, witness to people. I, I witness through my life. Now, sure, we should witness through our lives. But at the end of the day, people need to have the gospel explained to them. They're not going to understand the bad news and the good news just by observing that you're a good person or because they see you working at a soup kitchen or something like this or even healing somebody. They need explanation of what the gospel is. And so every, every Christian has that responsibility. Okay, I'll get off that soapbox. Um, so let's dig a little deeper on this miracle and, and think about signs and wonders. And we're going to connect back to chapter two as well. Um, but let's, let's consider the miracle itself again. So it says that the people in verse 10, it says they, you know, they come rushing together in wonder and amazement. Um, so what, what is especially awe-inspiring about this healing? A couple things. Isn't isn't he uh, the gentleman that was that was healed was on the older side, and he'd been brought there by friends a, a lot without getting healed, <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly everybody recognizes that oh, this is the guy that was late. Like everybody is a witness to this, and on top of that, he's jumping around. He's like crazy jumping around. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So he's brought, we're not really sure how old he, was, he is, um, but uh, he's brought there to beg. Um, don't confuse him with the guy who in, in Jesus's time is brought to the water to be healed. Ah, um, that was my bad. Yeah. Um, but so he's there as a beggar and people are used to seeing him there and, you know, giving him uh, some charity. Um, but what are we told about his physical condition? He was born lame. Yeah. So he's, um, lame, he's lame from birth, right? He's yeah. crippled from birth. From birth. This isn't an accident or something. He was born this way. And this has always been his condition. And then Jim alluded to, so what happens when he's healed? What does he do? It's not like he needs to learn how to walk. Yeah, exactly. 
there's no therapy. There's no recovery. No PT time. going on here. Right, right. <laughs> he doesn't need physical therapy. I mean, it's really amazing. This is one powerful miracle. And, you know, we, we often kind of miss this. We get used to reading these miracles and we miss how amazing they are. Here's a guy who's born lame. And um, some people have talked about that the Greek seems to indicate that his his ankle bones were, were dislocated and his heel was out of its socket or something to this effect. And it, but whatever the case was, it's instantly, miraculously put back together. And he's got the strength, not just to sort of shakily rise to his feet. He's walking and leaping and praising God, right? Yeah, it's sort of like uh, the opposite of uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when the grandfather gets out of bed and he's like, oh, and he's <laughs> wobbling around to the left and right. And, and then suddenly he's better, you know. He's yeah, like, right. Get right. away. No, this is this is instantaneous. They take him by the hand, bring him to his feet, and he's fine. So, you know, it, it's not simply that, oh, here's this guy, we knew he was lame, but he's been lame from birth, and he's instantly healed um, and able to function um, fully uh, on his legs again. So this is an amazing, powerful uh, miracle that takes place. So it, we got to ask the question, what is the purpose of signs and wonders? What's the purpose of signs and wonders? Now, Antonio already brought this up. So I, I want you to just mull on that a moment. What's the purpose of signs and wonders? Um, as Antonio mentioned, Isaiah 35, 5. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. So, Antonio, you want to tell us anything more about the context of this Isaiah passage? I mean, it puts but you on the, the uh, Isaiah, Isaiah is uh, sprinkled all over with, with messianic prophecies uh, about the kingdom to come. Uh, let me go back to Isaiah 35 right now. So, so Isaiah, Isaiah 35 speaks of a, of a kingdom to come uh, and speak, speaks of its majesty uh, and, uh, and, and, and the judgment of God. 35.4 says, says to the, say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. So, so, so it speaks of, 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 of the eternal kingdom of God taking place. Good, very good. So yes, this is one of the many Isaiah passages about the new creation, the, the kingdom of God coming to earth, God reigning in the earth. And, and you know, you'll see certain phenomenon happen and the lame will leap like a deer. Um, so, you know, Luke is, is deliberately reflecting upon um, this passage as he describes this man. Um, the, uh, the Jews in the temple would likely make this connection that a miracle of this order is like stuff they'd read in Isaiah. So it has to do with the coming kingdom of God uh, and the new creation. So let's, let's rewind back to uh, Acts chapter 2. And uh, could somebody read Acts 2, 14 through 21? You just read it off the screen or... You got your Bible handy? <coughs> you got I got it. it. Okay, Jim. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. But this is, uh, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, 
blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. You know, this is, this is Peter's first sermon, right? We, didn't, we haven't really mm -hmm. looked at it before, but he, he kicks it off by uh, defending what's going on with 120 disciples and that they're speaking in other tongues and you know, people are wondering what's going on. He says, we're not drunk. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel. And we look at this and we say, well, wait a minute. That, not everything that Joel is talking about was happening there on Pentecost. Um, so you know, what, what exactly is going on? Why does Peter mention all this apocalyptic end times stuff? Uh, in, in his Acts 2 sermon. Well, because what he's saying is, is that the long-awaited day of the Lord has arrived. It's arrived. It's here. And what the people are witnessing with the 120 disciples um, is uh, a fulfillment of what Joel had prophesied. The, the day of the Lord has come. And he he goes on to talk about two clear signs of the day of the Lord, and, and all Jews would have known this, the resurrection of the dead and the giving of God's spirit to his people. And so Peter explains about Jesus has risen from the dead. That's the most important resurrection from the dead that's happened. Um, and now they're witnessing the spirit of God coming into the hearts uh, of believers. So Peter is saying, this is it. What we have been waiting for for hundreds of years, this is now happening on this Pentecost day. Peter sees the coming of the Holy Spirit as the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy of God's reign coming to the earth, right? And that this is an event that will change history forever. <laughs> and that it signifies the end. And so he, he takes up apocalyptic language from Joel um, that actually covers quite a span of time, but is all sort of compressed into a few verses. Um, but Peter's saying, this is it. The end has come. The end has begun with the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of his spirit. The kingdom of God is coming to earth. All right? This is what it's so important for us to get our minds around. But then if you look at Acts chapter 3, verse 21, in the, the second sermon that's recorded, he talks about Jesus whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. So what's he talking about here? Um, he seems to be saying, in chapter 2, he's, he seems to be saying, the reign of God has come. It's here now. But here in chapter 3, he seems to be saying it's not quite here yet. Jesus has ascended to heaven until some other things happen and the fullness of God's reign will come. So what is Peter talking about? <laughs> is Peter confused? <laughs> um, Peter understands, however intuitively, um, by the Spirit, um, what's called inaugurated eschatology. There, there's your fancy theological term for the night that you've impressed your friends and family with. We were discussing inaugurated eschatology the other night. <laughs> so inaugurate, when you inaugurate something, it begins, right? Inaugurated eschatology. Eschatology has to do with end times, things of end times, uh, the last days. A simpler way of talking about it is the already and the not yet. The already and the not yet. And so Peter is reflecting this in his two sermons. In chapter two, he's emphasizing the already. God has sent his spirit. Jesus is risen from the dead. God has sent his spirit. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom is come. Is, is come. In chapter three, it's a little more the kingdom is here, but it's coming. It's not fully here yet. It's, it's a now or an already and a not yet, a now and not yet, an already and not yet. 
Um, I, it, one of my favorite analogies for, for getting a handle on this is the idea of D-Day, right? June 6, 1944, the Allies invade France at Normandy, and the, you know, they manage the, the invasion is successful. And at this point, everybody knows who's going to win the war, right? Once D-Day is successful, when the Germans couldn't throw the Allies off the beach, <laughs> they knew their name, their days were numbered. I mean, we even have you know, transcripts and um, uh, 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 telegrams or uh, you know, communications from the Nazis back and forth you know, saying they knew they were in trouble now and it was only a matter of time and they were kind of fighting to see how much they were going to lose. Um, and the Allies knew, okay, now we've gotten into France and um, we're going to win the war. But it was another year, right? Another year um, before World War II came to an end. So it's the same kind of idea. With Jesus' resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, we know the war is won. We know the victory of Jesus. We know the kingdom of God reigns. But it doesn't fully reign. So there's a now and a not yet. There's an already happening, and yet there's a fullness we're looking forward to. So what Peter's talking about is that the new creation is dawning in the midst of a fallen and decayed old creation. And the healing of this guy, I mean, he's a living example of the old decayed creation, right? He's a living example of the fall. And then he becomes a living example of the new creation, the Isaiah 35, 6 creation where we'll be leaping with joy and praising God. The kingdom of God is inaugurated into the very present rulership of Satan. And so Jesus is moving in and binding the strong man and setting people free. So the healing of the lame man is a declaration. It's a declaration that the last days are indeed here. There, there's no more work that God has to do, as it were. The, the Messiah has come, he's died and risen from the dead. It's finished. And now the reign of God is happening and we're, uh, we're working, we're, you know, we're advancing until the fullness of that reign comes. Let me pause for a minute. Any, any questions or thoughts? Is that making sense to you? So you know, this is this is really it's really very exciting. I mean, you know, um, what a what a powerful and beautiful ministry is going on here in Acts chapter three. Uh, we see Peter and John are essentially saying, "Look, the kingdom is here. People can be healed um, and be like the future now." So often we hear we often hear the question, uh, "Have you been filled with the Spirit?" Right. Christians ask one another this. Have you been filled by the Spirit? At least some Christians do. Um, besides the fact that that's reflecting kind of bad theology, um, the question really should be more, um, has the Spirit's infilling impelled you to people in need? Has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit empowered you for ministry toward others? If the Holy Spirit has come, and he has, and as believers, he inhabits our hearts, um, we should naturally be drawn toward those who don't know Jesus and want to minister to them, want to share the gospel with them. And that's really the question that we should be encouraging you know, one another with. So what's the church principle in all this? The church is to represent and manifest the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. All right, so the church should be a snapshot of what is coming. But even more than just kind of a picture of what's coming, it, we should be displaying the, uh, that future in the present. So the church is to represent and manifest the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. 
this is an entirely different mentality than uh, many churches have. Of, you know, well, we're just kind of holding up and taking care of ourselves until Jesus gets back, right? Trying not to lose any more sheep until the second coming. But, you know, it, it, we should have a much more dynamic mindset about this, where we're, we're moving out in the reign of God and extending his reign in the earth, binding the strong man and bringing the future into the present, bringing the not yet into the now. Say all that again. Say that one more time. Uh, <laughs> we should, the church should be uh, moving outward and extending the reign and rule of God in the earth. Uh, and bringing the future into the now, bringing the future into the now, bringing the not yet into the already. I like to use the phrase uh, kingdom bringers. Wherever we go, we bring the kingdom. We should, yes. Ideally, that's what we should be doing. We should be kingdom bringers. We are kingdom people. So, the empowering of the Holy Spirit is for all believers, right? And it should be, he should be a normal part of church life. Normal church life should be a spirit-empowered church life on all kinds of levels. So let me do something real quick here with you. And this is, again, go back to Acts chapter 2 and look at those um, those verses we read earlier that uh, I think Jim read for us, um, verses 17 through 21. So according to those verses, who receives the Spirit? So this is Acts 2, verses 17 through 21. Just look at those verses. Who receives the Spirit? All mankind. All mankind. Anybody else? All flesh. All flesh. Right? All flesh. And then toward the uh, end of his sermon, you know, Peter talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit to all who believe, right? So the Holy Spirit doesn't just come, it, all flesh means people without distinction, but you do have to be a believer. The Holy Spirit comes to believers, right? Um, so according to verses 17 through 21 of Acts 2, what types of people receive the Spirit? What different kinds of people receive the Spirit? Sons and daughters and young men and old men and bond slaves, and both men and women. Very good. So sons and daughters, young and old, men and women. Sorry, I missed bond slaves, didn't I? Yeah, and bond slaves. Um, so in other words, all kinds of people, right? Uh, no, no discrimination, no, no distinction between who, who gets to receive the Holy Spirit. Anyone who believes, anyone who believes in the Lord um, receives the, the Holy Spirit into their lives. And what happens, according to verses 17 through 21, when the Spirit is received? They'll prophesy. They'll prophesy. Yeah, that's kind of the main thing that's said there, right? I mean, Tongues is happening. That, that's sort of what's created this moment. Um, people are drawn as they hear their languages spoken. Prophecy, and then we're told toward the end of the chapter about signs and wonders uh, happening as well. So, in other words, miraculous stuff starts happening when the Holy Spirit comes. So, we're going to see, we'll see people other than the apostles operating in the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit as we journey through Acts. It's not just apostles who exercise uh, spiritual power, um, but all kinds of Christians do because all kinds of Christians can. Um, Paul in, in Corinthians you know, talks about wanting all Christians to pursue the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So the church principle here is that all believers receive the Holy Spirit and all believers can function in kingdom evangelism. All, right? all believers receive the Spirit. All believers can function in kingdom evangelism. 
there's a, a wonderful statement here that Paul makes in 1 Thessalonians 1 5. He says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, not that the word's unimportant, <laughs> but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Do you, do you see the well roundedness of that statement? You know, Paul's saying when we came to Thessalonica and, you know, witnessed to you and uh, planted a church there, um, you saw miracles. You saw power evangelism happening, kingdom evangelism, the Holy Spirit doing stuff. Um, the Holy Spirit was convicting people. You also saw what kind of people we were. You, you saw our character. You saw the way we treated others. And you heard the word that we preach. We explain now, this, the gospel. This uh, reminds me of the fact that in evangelism, we often talk about Jesus Christ, liar, lunatic, or Lord, and that God wouldn't have backed him up unless he was telling the truth about himself. Like, God wouldn't, have, wouldn't just raise some Joe Schmo from the dead just because he said, hey, I'm the son of God, you know? Yeah. He literally had to be the son of God in order for God to say, yeah, he's, he's, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to raise him from the dead and show you all that he's telling the truth about me. Yeah. Like everything that he says, I'm giving him the words to say it. And now all the people that I pour out my spirit on, I'm going to back them up too, if they believe. Right. Yep, that's right. That's right. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a wonderful picture in, the, in Paul's statement here that we should really seek the model, that people look at our character and our behavior and they're witnessing Christ um, that they see signs and wonders, um, and that they hear the word preached, right? Um, so you notice in chapter three, um, we've talked about the go mentality or go culture, and that's really beginning to happen now uh, in chapter three. We kind of get the impression in chapter two that the Christians were just kind of meeting together and people were being drawn in, but now they're, be they're beginning to move outward. Um, and we'll see that even sometimes despite themselves, um, God's going to move them outward. Um, and so the, the principle here is that signs and wonders should never be divorced from the teaching and preaching of the gospel. Um, this is kind of a summary statement of all that we've been saying. So it's not just going about healing people, <laughs> but it's healing people and telling them the gospel. Um, so it, we, we don't just you know, seek to pursue power ministry, um, but we, we, we uh, seek to minister to people in power so that a, a, the gospel, a way might be made for the preaching, for the teaching um, of the gospel. So I'm going to wrap it up here in just a minute. Um, any any other thoughts or questions? I, you know, clearly, my major point from chapter three is that um, churches should be signs and wonder churches. They should we should have spirit filled churches that are exhibiting the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Um, this is this is what's really marvelous and exciting. Um, the kingdom of God is here now, and the future uh, is working in the present. And the more we can lean into that and be about that, um, the better. Any other questions or comments before I give you two thoughts to mull upon? I have one, Chris. Yeah. Uh, that helps. Maybe you don't want me to ask. Um, so should should the churches today be, I'll just, how do I phrase this? Should the churches today be able to go out and evangelize and heal people off the street? Or is that a problem we have with American churches and it happens elsewhere in the globe? Or does it not happen anymore? Should signs and wonders be happening through Christians? Yeah. Yes. Like uh, as often as they are in uh, Acts 2, because you don't see it, you, at least 
in my experience, you don't see it too much here in the States at least. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a whole interesting discussion about why that is. Um, but signs and wonders are certainly happening in all kinds of other places. I see Billy nodding his head. <laughs> you see signs and wonders in India, Billy? Yes, sir. We have a lot of them uh, 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 in the television. We have a lot of groups gathering and of various church organizations. We see a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, you know, and this is something I'll get into in my Holy Spirit course, Person and Work of the Holy Spirit uh, next year. I will talk a little more fully about, you know, why churches don't experience signs and wonders and, and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Um, the problem is on, is on our side, not on his. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you know, and partly it's also a problem with leadership, that leadership needs to teach. The Holy Spirit, he's, he's not taught on a whole lot. Um, and uh, the, the leadership needs to teach on the Holy Spirit, needs to uh, give opportunities for learning to uh, do ministry in the power of the Spirit. Uh, so, you know, there's... It, it, there has to be a, a, a holy uh, a, a culture in which we anticipate the, the person and work of the Holy Spirit happening in our lives. Um, so yes, we, we churches should ideally um, be operating in signs and wonders and uh, uh, using the power of the Holy Spirit to advance the gospel. It, it is happening in lots of places in the world. It even happens in the U.S. Um, but uh, it's certainly happening in lots of other places. And, you know, as I alluded to and, you know, we'll continue to point out as we go through Acts, this is not just for apostles, it's not even just for leaders, it's for all Christians. The, the Spirit is given to all of us, um, men and women, young and old, slave and free, you know, all of us um, to operate in His power. Yeah, the requirements are very simple, too. I mean, I think it's in Galatians, Paul says, and doesn't the Lord work miracles and wonders amongst you because you believe? Chris, how would you take... Um, oh, oops, sorry. Go ahead, no. um, How would you uh, go about explaining to someone the differentiation between the signs and wonders happening in a lot of... Uh, in Pentecostal churches today versus, you know, what is happening over, say, in India and other places? Um, well, I'm just, I'm, all, I'm hesitating just because mm -hmm. I don't know how much I want to have this a part of this series. Um, this is, I mean, this is a perfectly good question. Um, the Somebody once said, um, when you're looking at supernatural phenomenon, always be aware that there are three spirits involved. The Holy Spirit, the human spirit, and the demonic spirit, you know, the devil. Um, and pretty much in any situation, all three of those are at play. Um, and the question is, who's, who's more prominent in that situation? Um, so, you know, sure, there are, there are people who are, you know, genuine Christians who are kind of abusing the gifts of the Spirit. Um, uh, and there are false prophets out there. There are, you know, false manifestations. Um, Satan certainly will try to discredit the, the power of God. We'll see that in Acts. There are counterfeit miracles. Um, but the key thing is, that any true work of the Holy Spirit is always going to point to Jesus. It's always going to be about Jesus. It's not going to be about the leader or the, you know, the miracle worker doing it. Um, I, I've been to meetings where um, the, uh, the minister really has a gift of healing, of, of uh, words of knowledge, you know, insight into people's lives. And people come to the meeting for that. You know, they, they, want, they want that to happen, right? And, and, 
you know, the teachers say, well, you're going to have to listen. <laughs> they don't say it this crassly, but they say, you're going to have to listen to an hour of teaching before we get to the, to the signs and wonders stuff. Um, because, you know, we're not just going to gather for signs and wonders. And if a church that is, that is centered on signs and wonders isn't centered on Jesus, right? Um, it, 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 those things, the, the bells and whistles, the fireworks, um, are to draw us toward Christ and his word and to help us to grow in maturity. Those don't become the end all and be all. And too often, that's what happens. It, we just, we love to chase the sensational. You know, just as human beings, we love the sensational. Um, and it's really not about that. Um, is that someone answering your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Oh, um, I, I just want to make one more comment. I should have done it earlier when we talked about the gate called, the man at the gate called beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, it's kind of apart from signs and wonders, but uh, I've often thought about how if the, uh, the disciples had given him money, we would never have that story. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, in this case, of course, they were being led uh, by the Holy Spirit and they um, didn't give him what he asked for. They gave him what they had. And um, I hadn't thought of it until tonight about that being an example of um, sort of possibly an exchange of, but it's a bad pun, but a currency that we've moved from like uh, when you use that wonderful phrase about um, the dynamic, um, but that we're moving from, as Christians, we should not be operating as, I mean, we, we still operate in the world, but that idea of that we've gained a new, um, different kind of way of operating with the Holy Spirit now, they could operate in a completely different way and in they're invading that territory or however you said that of Satan. But mm -hmm. um, that idea that they have progressed into a new realm, yeah. that they didn't have to just offer what this world has, they could offer something. Well, yes, they had, exactly. They had more to offer. Peter and John had entered in to the kingdom of God. Um, they'd entered into the end times. They'd entered into the last days, and they wanted to share that with others. And, and that speaks, too, to the issue of why don't we see more signs and wonders in the life of many churches? Um, and, and even churches that are into signs and wonders, why does it seem some, somewhat dysfunctional and, and unattractive maybe? Be, because we, we don't have a go mentality. And more and more as I taught this stuff and thought about this, um, I, we have really neglected that the main point of the signs and wonders is not for us, it's for the unsaved, um, that we need to direct uh, this outward. I, I was talking with a woman recently, um, pastor's wife, and she has many illnesses and has had, you know, for decades, um, just crippling uh, illnesses. And you know, tons of people have prayed for her. I organized a prayer meeting, you know, laying on of hands and praying for her. Um, and <laughs> predictably, you know, when, when I pray for somebody, they get worse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the next day she said, oh, I felt really horrible the next day. <laughs> I said, I warned you. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, and I was talking with her and she knows the presence of God in her life. This is a very godly woman. But she's like, why can't, you know, why aren't I being delivered from all these physical ailments? And I said, you know, do you kind of wonder sometimes if um, the, the signs and wonders and healing is more for non-Christians than for Christians? You know, we, we've got the most important healing. We've got the most important thing, salvation. Um, and, you know, God uses... Uh, the Holy Spirit's power is directed more toward non-Christians than Christians. You know, not that we shouldn't pray for one another's healings and that type of thing, but um, I think we need to be much more outward focused in our mindset. And when we look around the world, that's I, my impression is that's more what we see. Signs and wonders happening in evangelism, on the mission field, um, in, in church planting. Any other questions or comments? 
yeah, Antonio. Uh, just a quick side comment. I, I'm still uh, very amazed by by the transformation that we see in Peter. Uh, you, you might, you guys might remember that previously in John, they, they they ran into a man who's also blind from birth, and and Peter's interest is like, oh, who's seen? Who can I point my finger to? Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, he's not concerned about why this this man is crippled from birth. He doesn't ask questions uh, like who's seen? Your mom or your dad? He just goes ahead and and in the name of Jesus. Uh, proclaims, declares health upon the individual. So I, I, I like that very much. Uh, that's an excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, point. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's kind of cutting through. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, here's Peter, of course, who knows how bad sin can be because he betrayed Jesus, right? And yet has received Jesus' forgiveness and has now received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Um, he knows no matter what a person's background is, Jesus loves them and, you know, the Holy Spirit's power uh, can touch their lives. And so, yeah, he just comes and ministers. Excellent. That's an excellent point. Anything else? Here's something to mull on, musings to mull. Um, does your church tend to dwell in the already or the not yet? So in other words, a church that, that thinks more about the not yet um, is, is thinking, well, we can't have, have these things, right? This isn't going to happen. But if they understand that there's an inbreaking of the kingdom, it's going to be already. And, and then, you know, how about you as an individual, as a, as a Christian, which, which do you tend to live in, the already uh, or the not yet? Do, do you live in as uh, one with the understanding that the kingdom of God has come, has come. Well, let's, uh, let's close uh, with prayer. Um, Carol, can I ask you to pray for us? Carol, are you with us? <laughs> can you close this in prayer? Sure. Thanks. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this this time of uh, teaching. Thank you for how you're you're re reminding and teaching us uh, the the significance of of your resurrection and the filling of your spirit and our our work to be done to to go out and. And and uh, Lord, I just thank you for your word. Thank you that you didn't uh, didn't leave us wandering, uh, wandering uh, around without direction. Lord, I thank you for for your guidance. And uh, Lord, I just just pray for uh, each of us who hears this teaching, and and for for others who are just being led by uh, by you, Lord. I just pray for you to be honored, to be glorified, and for for believers to uh, to continue to grow and and just uh, just just more of you, Lord. We pray, In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you for the the good questions, the good discussion. Uh, and I'll see you again next week. Same bat time, same bat time. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> I was like, he's going to do it. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.